By the end of 2009, for the first time in history, over 50% of the workforce will be made up of women. Was this the work of a cultural shift or simply the reality of today's economy? As the workforce changes, how do men now view female power? And what needs to happen to make all of this run smoothly? Tonight, has the battle of the sexes come to an end? I'm Ernie Manous, and this is Houston 8. In 1848, the first Women's Rights Convention is held in New York, calling for equal treatment of women and men under the law and voting rights for women. 1903, the National Women's Trade Union League is established to improve wages and working condition for women. 1920, the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote is signed into law. Between 1940 and 1944, due to World War II, The number of working American women increases by 57 percent, filling positions in every sector of the economy. But these women are expected to return to their everyday housework once the men return from war. 1961, President John Kennedy establishes the President's Commission on the Status of Women. 1963, Congress passes the Equal Pay Act, making it illegal for employers to pay a woman less than what a man would receive for the same job. 1966, The largest women's rights group in the U.S., the National Organization for Women, is founded and seeks to end sexual discrimination, especially in the workplace. 1967. President Lyndon Johnson expands the affirmative action policy of 1965 to cover discrimination based on gender. As a result, federal agencies and contractors must ensure that women enjoy the same educational and employment opportunities as white males. 1972. The Equal Rights Amendment is passed by Congress and sent to the states for ratification. Originally drafted in 1923, it reads, Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. 1982. That amendment dies when it fails to achieve ratification by a minimum of 38 states. 2009. President Barack Obama signs the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Restoration Act, named after a former Goodyear employee who was paid 15 to 40 percent less than her male counterparts, allowing victims of pay discrimination to file a complaint with the government against their employer. 2010. According to the Rockefeller Foundation, more than 50 percent of the U.S. workforce will be women, with almost 40 percent of households having women as their primary breadwinner. So we've come a long way, but just because the workforce has evened out, has equality truly been reached? Has the war between the sexes come to an end? Joining us tonight are Saki Ndakwa, Development Manager with Houston Works USA, and Dr. Elizabeth Gregory, Director of Women's Studies at the University of Houston. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for coming. Let's start with Dr. Gregory and just say, has the battle of the sexes come to an end? The sexes are still trying to figure it out. I don't think you have to phrase it as a battle, but certainly it's an ongoing negotiation about roles uh, that's been in ch- in a changing mode uh, for almost the past 200 years. Yeah. So uh, it continues to change, and many things have improved, but there's still things to do. Saki, according to Time Magazine, which is getting a lot of attention this mm-hmm. week because of their article about the state of the American women, they're talking more about how Everyone is okay with this, that it's coming together out of necessity. People need this now, and family structure has changed. I agree with that. I do think the because of the economy, things are changed. And traditionally, what when we had a male breadwinner and a female homemaker, um, only now one out of five families is doing that. Um, it's a necessity. Women have to work. And a lot of times women are looking for work, whereas before they may have st- jumped out of the workforce to take care of their family, take care of their kids, and now because maybe their husband is being laid off, afraid of being laid off, they have medical expenses that they need to take care of, and so now they're being forced to join the workforce. Now, when we say workforce, I just want our audience to know that in no way are we discounting work in the home. But just for the sake of our discussion, workforce means an employer outside of the home working, and then there is work that happens at home. Um... And there's a bunch of different ways I want to go with this, but I'm going to go back to Dr. Gregory and say, where along the line did having a job outside the home 
become the paramount, the thing you wanted. Why is that, in a sense, the position of power? How come we didn't develop saying the woman is the one who is more fortunate? She gets to be in the home. She works with the children. The family unit is built around that. The morals of the family, the stature of the family comes out of the woman, and the poor man has to go out and toil out here. Why didn't it develop that way? Why did that become something women want? If you're following my question. I think in in a big picture kind of way, because business has depended on women to raise their workers for free and they needed them to feel that they had no other options and in it that's a sort of cynical way to look at the way we've we've framed the options for women to stay at home Uh, and for a long time women didn't have any other options in terms of uh, work and it's as you say it's a lot of work to raise a family Um, and Largely that had to do with lack of birth control. They simply had children. They had to take care of them. Uh, And then they didn't have a lot of options outside the home. So the situation has been transformed uh, with the arrival of birth control uh, at the same time, which began to be practiced in the beginning of the 19th century, and it's been increasing in the beginning of the... In 1800, the average U.S. woman had seven children. In 1900, the average U.S. woman had 3.5 and in 2000, she had two. So that changes the kinds of commitment that women have at home, just in terms of time. Also, the average woman lives 30 years longer than she used to. So all these factors play into women having other things to do uh, in addition with their time and uh, time to be educated, time to become a different kind of worker than they were prior. So a lot of it is very logistical in terms of what women want to do with their time. And it also has to do with the kinds of realities of status that have been in play. You ask, you know, why didn't we do it the other way? Well, for whatever reason, uh, we didn't do it that way. And there, because, you know, the same mantra that went along with the U.S. revolution, you know, no taxation without representation, women have not been represented in policy-making roles, and therefore the policy of the nation has not reflected uh, an understanding that it uh, is important to raise families and to support families. With all of the movements that have been going on, and the civil rights movement, and all the stuff that we had in our setup package there, women's experiences are changing, and the changing experience of the woman's life has led to her being able to go into different fields. But are we seeing that in the job force? Are women now breaking out of those? According to Time Magazine, they're saying that the majority of the women's roles are still being taken by nursing, retail, and customer service, kind of traditional women roles. Unfortunately, at this point, no, that hasn't changed much. Um, Last year, the top three employment occupations for women were still the nurses, the um, medical fields, education, um, and we've had those roles or those jobs. I mean, that's always been a women-dominated field, and I think that's why the numbers show that although there are more women in the workforce than men or were even, Mm -hmm. it's not because there's more of us working or entering the workforce. We've always been there. There's just the, the jobs that the men have in those industries, those are where the cutbacks are in the construction industry, in the manufacturing industries. Those are the ones that are being affected, whereas the government jobs, the jobs in the medical field, the jobs in education, those aren't being affected as much as in this economy. So once the economy rebounds, will then things shift back to more men in the workplace? Is this just a product of what's going on economically right now? Either of you, whichever. Likely, at least in the short term. I mean, the other side, of there are two aspects to women's work that are uh, changed and or not so changed. The one that Saki points to is that women have traditionally been in professions and been in paid workforce doing things that looked a lot like what they did at home for free. They were taking care of children, they were cooking, cleaning, uh, that kind of job. So those were seen as appropriate to women and they were moved into those positions and Those tended to be the positions that they could get jobs in where they would have some kind of flexibility, whereas the better paid, higher status jobs were structured so that you couldn't take time off uh, to take care of a family. They were structured where, and that almost sounds like you're saying it was a ploy, it was a way to keep women out of it. Is that what you mean? uh, Whether there's intention or not, that is the effect. And it's Again, largely because of who's making policy. So if you have people in positions uh, making the rules about the jobs who have that freedom, they'll see, well, that's what I can do, so that's what the job should be. 
Um, and I agree with Dr. Gregory. I mean, I think it's the types of jobs. If my job requires me to work 50 hours a week and I have three kids that I need to take care of, of course I'm not going to be able to fulfill or not, maybe not want to fulfill those obligations because I need to balance my work and my home life. Whereas men probably have a little more flexibility if they have somebody that can pick up the kids, do the dry cleaning, and they can still work the 50 hours, whereas the women may have to pick up the slack at home. Some will argue, and I think you're setting it up perfectly for this, if it's candidate A and candidate B, and we know nothing more about them, but candidate A can put in 50, 60 hours a week at work, and candidate B can only put in, on a good week, 30, 35 because of other responsibilities, whatever those are. As a manager, should I not value A over B, candidate who can give me more and reward them for more work and time that they can put in? Is that not a good way to look at it? Well, there are lots of... Um ways to look at it in, in terms of small picture and big picture. One big picture way um, is to ask managers to keep in mind the larger interests of um, the society. And what we've done, lar- and I, I'll come back to okay. the, the, the concerns <laughs> of the business per going. se, right. um, but uh, the system that we have assumes that the home is a site of consumption. And what we uh, are moving toward or starting to raise um, the possibility is looking at the home as a site of production as well because we have tended to see family as you know you have kids for your enjoyment and you know mothers and fathers might want to raise their <laughs> eyebrows about that uh, but at some level you're making that choice it was your decision it's, and then there's the what you hear is it's your family it's your problem why should the rest of us care about your family that was your decision but that elides the understanding that we all know secretly that we all depend on somebody having children for there to be uh, a next generation, for there to be workers, for there to be customers, for there to be citizens, for there to be soldiers, all these purposes. We depend on people having children and not only having bodies, but doing a good job of raising them, making them good workers, educating them, all those things. And we expect that of women and we expect them to do that for free and we will blame them whether they do it or not anyway but there's a system that um, creates that um, that understanding that we could change if we see it as a I system don't think, of though, production. anyone is saying women shouldn't be having children families shouldn't be growing but simply from a cap I'm Mr. Capitalist sitting here right now and I want the most bang for my buck if I'm going to pay you I'm going to Yusaki on this one if I'm going to if I'm asking for these requirements for an employee and I can pay them that much for that, as soon as we start changing any of these requirements, then maybe the salary is going to go down. And all of this for me is going to the point that women make 70 cents per the male dollar. But address that if you could. Well, that's one of the problems, I think, why you find more men um, in the executive positions or women that have children that decide, okay, Because my husband makes more money than I do, maybe there were two salaries at one time, I'm not going to work because he makes more money. Instead Mm -hmm. of the husband saying, well, you know, I make more money, I'll take care of the kids and you work. You know, it doesn't make economic sense for families. And I think that's what's happened. But now, you know, women are being forced to go back into the workforce. Um, And to your point, um, I don't think it's fair that, you know, women are being paid less than men for the same job because in some cases women are still doing the 60 and 70 hour work weeks and still taking care of the kids. It's not a great work-life balance for them but they're they're doing it. I recently spoke to a university vice president. I won't say what university or what it was. She is no longer there. When she was there she was being paid a very nice salary. When she left the gentleman that they hired in her place made 75 percent more than she did for the same job. She insists it was because she was a woman and he was a man. Is this going on that blatantly today? Yes. How? (laughs) How can that be? Well, I want to just go back to the point you were um, evolving there in terms of what capitalists, uh, how they think about their bottom line. Um, I think that capitalists actually are um, assuming that women will do a lot of work for them and that the work that women do in raising children is completely essential to capitalists because, again, they want somebody to raise those workers. But they've been used to getting it for free. 
Mm -hmm. And so saying that that's not part of their bottom line is like uh, ignoring the environment and the importance of the environment. And once you start polluting Which it... Which many capitalists do do. That's right. <laughs> Those are two shared uh, assumptions that there's a kind of, produ of uh, work that's going to simply be provided for free that the business can build on. And those are land and workers. But once those start getting problematized, then you start have to look, starting ha having to look at it and see, well, maybe we actually need to invest in family. Maybe we need to invest in child care so that women will continue to want to have children. But that is changing. There is more child care in the workplace. There is more. Uh, we have a case here at the station where one of our employees just had twins. He and his wife both work. She took time off while having the children. Now he is taking a period of time off to be with the children so she can go back to work. So there are these flexible programs out there, aren't there? 34% or of something close to that uh, of people have access to good, affordable child care. The rest of them don't. Right. So, yes, in certain kinds of environments. But we're looking at it as a team now, more so. Yes, that's According true. to all the stats and things, especially in the Time Magazine and the Rockefeller Foundation, it's, we're going at this as we're a unit now. I, I, I think that that um, responds to exactly the question that you were asking at the beginning about, you know, have things changed? I think, yes, they have. And a lot of it's because women are so much more present in the workforce. And because they're, you know, they're in what you could call peer marriages, mm -hmm. where both people are doing similar work, they're similarly educated, and so it doesn't make sense anymore when they come home that Susie's going to do all the work and Jim is going to put his feet up. Jim is not only not putting his feet up, but he's finding out that he really likes his kids. And increasing number of men want to spend more time with their children. And so evolving a kind of a policy at work for capitalists that makes families, uh, that makes workers, male and female, feel that they don't have to work 80 hours a week in order to be provided for, because there is an upcoming generation that wants things different from what they had, uh, and they, in order to retain both of those, male and female workers, uh, there's a reason to evolve workplace policy uh, that is more family friendly. I, and I, I just want to go back to this other point that we have been talking about, and it still kind of baffles me. It's the 77 cents to the dollar, that actually women are being paid less for the same job doing the same thing. Now, pretty much in our package, we've explained that is illegal to some degree, but there's this kind of wiggle room in there. How does all of this work? How is it that, because your applicant cannot, I mean, granted, you know from a name right. what you're dealing with, but... How but I think that until that policy play? is enforced, and then it's enforced. I mean, it's easy to say, yes, we have these policies in place, but unless somebody's enforcing them, and, you know, generally wages, especially in a lot of these private corporations, are private. So how would you know what I make if we're not ever discussing? I'll never know that you make, you know, $50,000 more than I did for the same exact position. And until we have, I guess, more transparency about salaries, Mm -hmm. that's, unfortunately, it's still happening. Over at Houston Works USA, mm -hmm. you folks are a wonderful service for the community, finding jobs. Is there anything in what you see coming across through that organization that shows this trend of maybe men being paid more than women in similar jobs? How does that happen? Because In some of the positions that the employers do list what the salary is, but in a lot of them they don't. Okay. Um, and like I said, until it becomes more transparent, where all until companies salary ranges right, too, right? Right. And that's what the Lily Ledbetter law that you mentioned was all about. That they had uh, it was illegal to ask your other people in your uh, job what their salary was. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a method that the employer has for keeping disparities uh, hidden. Okay. This this might be out on a limb a little bit, but I'm going to go there anyway. In my mind. As children, we tend to look at girls in school. They're more mature. They seem to pay more attention. They're, they're smarter in many ways. You look at a class of the, the top-ranking students in an elementary school, and pretty much you're going to have mostly girls up there. The guys tend to be a little less focused on what they're doing, whether or not that makes them smarter or not. Then you have the, the influence of teachers calling on boy students more than girls, which kind of levels out that playing field. But if, in fact, women are quicker to grasp a concept, logically minded, more mature at an earlier age, when does the shift happen that suddenly the man is more desirable to have as your employer, or employee than the woman? 
Well, I think part of it is that there's more men in executive positions. There's more men that are hiring or making the decisions about who they're hiring. Mm -hmm. um, and men, I mean, like you mentioned the fact that you may look at a resume and think about this is a man, this is a woman. Does she have kids? Is she going to need time to take off to take care of these kids if they're sick? It, things like Shouldn't that. Shouldn't that, though, be something you as an employer do look at? Is that not a fair thing to question? Well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you create situations where women don't have the opportunity to move into positions where they might be working more and their husbands might be staying home. Mm -hmm. So you're simply keeping women in that role. Uh, it, it's a shifting role. And the other element, as I was suggesting, is that you have to um, open yourself to a different kind of work ethic that does have a kind of big picture view that understands that people do not necessarily uh, do their best if they're working 80 hours mm -hmm. uh, a week. And there are other ways of conceiving the workplace. Another issue for women is if they do step out, we've been told that uh, once you come, if you step out for three years or something like that because you want to be flexible or be available for your kids, um, if you step out full-time or you go to a part-time schedule, then there's no coming back. And this has always puzzled me. I mean, if you start off on day one, uh, you know nothing, and you come in and you learn. So then you have somebody who's been there for 10 years, and suddenly she needs to step out for whatever reason, or he needs to step out, uh, and they call it the mommy track, and she comes back, and she's never taken as seriously again because she wasn't demonstrating that she was devoted to the workforce in the same way, as though she suddenly had become an idiot and couldn't at least do what she did on day one, which was learn from scratch, and presumably she wouldn't have to do that. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of double talk in the way people's jobs are understood to operate. As we see all of this happening, and, and I'm curious because you, you kind of bring it up, what is going to happen to our family structure? We seem to have been so b into the belief system that one day we will have that imaginary 1950s America again. And yet more and more we move away from that concept. Now with two parents working, is that going to change the existence of the children? Where are they going to get the nurturing? All of those fears... What, what do we look at then? I think we're there. And we're watching Mad Men, and we're not like in the 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's pretty cynical 1950s and the or 60s. Yeah. And the 1950s never really was the image we seem to have of it, too. Remember the Lucy show? That's always my example. The 1950s was after the 1940s, uh, obviously, uh, and the war and all the women being asked to go home after... Um, being Rosie the Riveter. And people have been watching The Lucy Show, which debuted in the 50s, um, ever since. It's always been in reruns. In fact, they invented the rerun. Um, but uh, the whole issue that was the nugget of that show was whether or not Lucy was a competent worker. She kept thinking she could work. You know, she was a good worker. And they kept proving her that she was really not. You know, mm -hmm. and, and Ricky had to, like, help her out because... She had these aspirations that were above her real capacities. So obviously she was an idiot. Um, you know, she was nice, but she should really stay at home. But the opposite uh, message was also being pushed toward us or demonstrated to us by the fact that this is Lucille Ball, who was the highest paid worker in <laughs> Hollywood at the time, and it's called I Love Lucy, and it's, it's sort of sh flip showing you the flip side. So on the one hand, we're getting this hard sell about how women are incompetent, but we're also getting a sense of women really would like to be doing something else, and hey, they actually can. So there's a sense that, you know, that was a, that was a big tension in that show about whether or not women could work, but it was all built around the understanding that women did want how to work. How dangerous do you think, though, and by dangerous, how, how suggestive is seeing a show like that to the audience watching it? Because they talk now in the recent presidential election that we saw mass media images of female presidents and African-American presidents through our popular drama and that that started to ease into the idea that this could really happen. I'm thinking now the backside of it is, okay, you see I Love Lucy every week and everyone watches it and she can't hold a job. Did that hold women back, do you think? Well, I think, I think you're getting the double message because you were seeing Lucille Ball succeed at the same time that you were seeing her say mm -hmm. that Lucy couldn't, Lucy Ricardo couldn't. So you're getting a, that double message. Take me up then to Desperate Housewives, a very popular show on TV now. 
and they've got one of the characters dealing with the workforce. She's pregnant, doesn't tell her boss, because if you're pregnant, you won't get the promotion. It seems like everything that's happening here... Yeah has happened on TV now. I sadly do not have time to watch Desperate Housewives, <laughs> but I, what I do uh, see is the tabloids when I go grocery shopping, right? And they are all about babies and who's pregnant and how and when. And, you know, th- we have a big issue around um, sort of our sense of what's appropriate for babies and wh- where in women's lifespans they should be having babies. I want to address, I am a big Desperate Housewives <laughs> okay. fan. So... Um, but yeah, I, I think that's typical of what is going on. You see that she is an executive um, and she works probably 60, 70 hours a week and her husband has had to pick up the slack or some of the slack, but she's still having to do a lot of it um, and just having to balance it. And I think that's the reality for a lot of women that are out there still having to work in these high power. So is that a good thing? And we've got this, these role models, I guess we're creating these fictional role models telling you, you can do it this way. Or are these role models simply reacting to what is already happening? Which one do you think is coming first? I think the role models are reacting to what's happening. I think um, it's just society. That's what we've become, or maybe we've always been, like the Lucy show. It's just coming full circle. Unfortunately, we're going to have to stop right there because we've run out of time. Thank you both very much. I hope you'll join us again and we can continue this conversation. And that does it for us tonight. Until next time, I'm Ernie Manus. Thank you for joining us. Have a great week.